It started with a very nice call congratulating me that I had won $3.8 million. 52-year-old Maria Guerra lives in Texas. She's working three jobs just to make ends meet. It is not the life she expected when she got that very nice call. I trusted them. I gave all my trust to them. And it got to the point to where they would call me on a daily basis three, four times to see if I could get any money. The callers were asking Hello? for cash to pay for what they said Hi, were Mr. customs, processing yes, fees, and taxes on the prize money. Yes. No, millions of dollars is millions of dollars. Maria believed she could be Please, rich, like her sister, who had just won the Texas lottery. She did. She won one million dollars. But for Maria, there was no money to win. She was a victim of a lottery scam well known to investigators in the Caribbean island nation of Jamaica, where the perpetrators were based. The fact is, with globalization, there's no border really, to crime. It's transnational. Superintendent Fitz Bailey is the head of the organized crime Hello. unit in Jamaica. And I guess what is happening in Jamaica is just the pattern that is happening right across the globe. It's called cybercrime. Criminals using the internet for unprecedented access to victims worldwide. In the lottery fraud, scammers use a technique known as data mining. Unscrupulous individuals in Jamaica obtain data of overseas um, citizens. The listing gives biographical data. The scammers knew how to pressure Maria to pay their fees, fees that would drain her life savings and would never deliver the millions she had hoped for. You've seen the amounts. Maria even borrowed money from friends and relatives. Look, the people that trusted me. I used all my money, and it's my fault. The money that they loaned me. And it was a lot. Still, Maria believed she had won a fortune. Her friends and family couldn't convince her otherwise. Then they started knocking at the door, and they wanted their money. So. I isolated myself. I stopped going to the stores. I stopped going to the movies. I stopped going to the gym. I started just not turning on the lights. I started living in the dark. Maria's husband could not understand her bizarre behavior. <laughs> and then one day, he just threw me out of the house. I ended up at the center where homeless people live. I had to get in line to, to get a shower. I had to get in line for a ticket to have a meal. I was ashamed. Maria is not alone. Anne Mao's body washed ashore on a New Jersey beach. Police believe the 72-year-old grandmother may have been driven to suicide by her experience with the Jamaican lottery. Callers told the former bookkeeper that she had won two and a half million dollars. The caller said all she had to do was claim her prize. After she received the notices informing her that she's the winner of 2.5 million dollars, she gave further instructions on how to send money in order to collect her winnings. Karen Harrison, an investigator with Jamaica's Financial Crimes Unit, spoke with Anne several times about her case. She became convinced that, yes, money is there for me to win. Harrison discovered the scammers knew Anne's name and address. They even knew about her fondness for sweepstakes and that she had once won a trip to Jamaica. By the time the con was over, Anne had lost her entire life savings, almost a quarter of a million dollars. After a while, she realized that all these calls was just fictitious and it was a scam and she became so depressed, she became reclusive and eventually she reached a stage where she took her own life. Montego Bay in the western part of Jamaica is where the frauds began. 
It's the hub of a huge network of lottery scammers. The area used to be the heart of the drug trade, but now cybercrime is flourishing here. Some of our major narcotics players were actually extradited to the United States. It created a vacuum. The lottery scam, I believe, has actually filled that vacuum. Like the drug traffickers that they have replaced, the largest fraud operations are highly organized networks employing many people. There are list makers, people who call victims, people to take calls, money collectors, security and financiers. They would set up something like what we call a boiler room. You go into those rooms, you will see cell phone set up, laptops, people paid to make these phone calls. So it's like they set up a genuine business. And that sole intention of that business is to run the lottery scam. And business is booming. According to US security officials, Jamaican scammers collected $30 million from American citizens in 2008. It is providing significant amount of wealth to the perpetrators. You can see manifestation of this in the type of houses that are built, the, the lifestyle that these guys demonstrate. It, it, it's very lavish. A Jamaican reporter interviewed this anonymous insider. Young men, 14, 13 year old, they're millionaires and they're their own boss. They have three story houses, they have everything. At times, there are scenes of frenetic excess. Eyewitnesses say young people throw parties along a tiny road called the Hip Strip. Their expensive cars clog the street. These guys who participate in the lottery scam, they meet where they actually burn money to see who can burn the most money. There's an even more sinister side to these scams. Organized crime and local gangs use their money to purchase weapons, leading to an escalation in violent crimes. We have identified over 200 murders that are linked directly or indirectly to the latter scam in the western part of our island, that is Montego Bay. The violence, wealth and sophistication of Jamaican lottery rackets and their ability to reach beyond borders to ensnare American citizens has long been a concern to the United States Government Department of Homeland Security. DHS joined forces with Jamaican authorities to create JOLT, Jamaican operations linked to telemarketing. We have several agents that are temporarily assigned for long-term uh, duty in Jamaica. Uh, to work solely on uh, these cross-border financial crimes. Van's calendar, attaché to the U.S. Embassy in Kingston, was instrumental in carrying out the JOLT program. He was also the primary liaison with Jamaican authorities. We have a tremendous effort underway right now. We're already seeing the fruits of our labor. They're starting to learn that they can be reached in another country, uh, that they can be held accountable for their crimes. In June 2009, JOLT agents in Jamaica launched a raid in the Montego Bay area. Hundreds of cell phones, computer equipment, and digital phone cards were confiscated. Lottery fraud ringleaders were arrested. To date, 85 people have been apprehended and six indicted. JOLT has recovered over $750,000 for victims including $10,000 for Maria. But Jamaica's prosecutors have been thwarted by legislation written for a pre-digital era. From most of these will Sergeant be Patrick Linton heads the Jamaican Constabulary's Cyber Crime Investigation and Research Unit. This, this machine? Jamaican <laughs> officials believe the new laws, prison terms, and fines of up to $2 million will cut into the thriving lottery scam and the criminality that it feeds. Initiatives spearheaded by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC, are helping too. Law enforcement officers here have attended forensic computing workshops in order to keep ahead of the criminals. Tisha is now conducting an investigation using NCASE forensics. 
in a lottery scam case. Investigators, with the help of family members in the United States, are still pursuing Anne's case. Maria is struggling to put her life back together. With her $10,000, she has begun paying back the money that she borrowed. Although she lost everything to the scam, she still gets lottery offers. But she is a lot more cautious now. I learn from mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. I'm human. My kids were the ones that told me, Mom, if you win something, you don't have to pay to get that money that you want. 